All right, well, Aristotle is asking the same question that a lot of the people that we've discussed this semester are asking. And, uh, you know, that question is, well, what is the secret to a good life? What does it mean uh, to be moral? Mm -hmm. Now, again, for these, for these ancients, Epicurus, Aristotle, uh, they thought that uh, um, morality was the question of happiness, uh, fulfillment. Right. Now, uh, for Aristotle, the answer to this question, right, the, you know, the question is, how, you know, what does it mean to, be, to live a good life? The answer to this question was cultivating uh, the virtues, or we might understand them as habits. And which uh, habits should we cultivate? Well, it's those habits that perfect the mind and the will. To understand Aristotle's theory, we have to start with what he means when he's talking about uh, uh, goods. Now, uh, you know, I've, I'm fond of saying this, and uh, you know, I think Aristotle is very much right about this. Uh, you, you know, every every action, every activity, every thing that a, a human being does has an end. Right? You know, an end is the the goal, or the purpose, or the reason for pursuing that end or that activity. And that, you know, that goal, that purpose, well, that's a good. Mm -hmm. That's a good. So, you know, when you eat, what's the end? Well, the end is to uh, satisfy hunger, for nutrition. You know? So satisfying hunger, is, you, know, to, you know, to provide nutrition for the body, this is a good. Okay. So, uh, there are at least, I mean, there's many different kinds of <laughs> goods, uh, but there's at least uh, two ways that we can talk about goods. We could talk about uh, instrumental goods, and we could talk about independent goods. Instrumental good is uh, a good that is good for something else. So it's good for the sake of something else. Right. And an independent good is good because of, well, what that is. It's good in and of itself. Independent good is also quite often, especially in today's language called an intrinsic good. An intrinsic good. Well, you know, well, since we're looking at Aristotle's reading here, we'll stick with independent good. Now, uh, you know, so we have two different kinds of goods, independent good and intrinsic good. Okay. Uh, sorry, I, I'm sorry. <laughs> Instrumental good and independent good. All right. So what would be an example of this? Well, suppose, um, yeah, suppose you want to study computer programming. Suppose you want to study computer programming. Well, you can't do computer programming very long without having to be able to type. Uh, if you're going to program a computer, you've got to be able to uh, type on a keyboard. So typing, uh, if you pursue typing for the sake of computer programming, well, typing is a good. It is. You know, this skill and typing is a good, but it is uh, an instrumental good. It is good for something else. Namely, it's good to improve your abilities in computer programming. You really can't get very far in programming without being able to type. Or um, say you're a cook, right? say you like to cook. Uh, well, in addition to being able to mix a variety of tastes, right? you know, this, is, this is kind of the essence of cooking, is, is being able to produce a dish that's not only nutritious, but tastes are really good. Uh, you probably also have to get kind of good at chopping and cutting with a knife. This isn't, you know, an essential part of learning how to mix tastes. Right? Supposedly, you could, you know, suppose you could have somebody who uh, chops all your food for you, I and mean, that happens. Uh, but in order to improve your skills, in order to make things easier for you, uh, be being skilled with a knife and you know, sharpening a knife, keeping a knife good and sharp. Well, that, that's an instrumental good for cooking. That is good, that skill is good for the sake of this other skill, for the sake of, of cooking. All right. Uh, so we've got instrumental goods, and we've got independent goods. And, these are, and the independent goods are good for the sake of themselves. So here's a question. Do we have a multiplicity of these independent goods? Is there... Uh, you know, just, you know, variety of independent goods you could choose from? Or, uh, is there one good that is good above all of these? 
is there are this chief, what we might call this chief independent good, or this chief good. And Aristotle thinks there is. Aristotle says this chief good, this independent good at which everything else aims at, right? the chief good is what everything else aims at, Aristotle says this chief good is happiness. The chief good is happiness. So, the question becomes, what's happiness? Well, this question is then, what is happiness? To get the ball rolling, Aristotle considers, you know, at least in his time, three prominent suggestions. Sensuality, or pleasure, uh, honor, or we might, what, what we might call social recognition, and contemplation. And sensuality is the first one he looks at. And, you know, sensuality is pretty straightforward, right? It's not hard to imagine what Aristotle's talking about here. We, you know, we, uh, your average night in Las Vegas, right? <laughs> Um, you know, that would be an example of sensuality. Uh, you know, your physical pleasures, you know, a life uh, pursuing good food, good wine, good times, uh, uh, you know, your basic hedonistic lifestyle. Aristotle thinks that isn't going to do it. Now, the reason why, uh, you know, first he considers uh, Sardanopolis. <laughs> now, Sardanopolis, you know, Aristotle thought, and this was, this was the leading thought at the time, was the, the last Assyrian king. And this guy got real self-involved. He pursued pleasure to its fullest, in the, you know, to its, to its ends, right? Uh, you can imagine the variety of things that Sardanopolis uh, tried to do. And, uh, you know, at least according to the legend, this led to, uh, you know, this kind of self-centered view that Sardanopolis had of itself. And, and uh, uh, you know, this is real extreme narcissism and eventually his, his political ruin and violent upheaval. So you know, what Aristotle is trying to do here is say, you, know, well, you don't want to pursue sensuality because look what happened to Sardanopolis. Okay. Yeah, you know, that, that's good as far as it goes, except that probably Aristotle really did not have very good information about Sardanopolis. It looks like the information he had about him was, was, was wrong. But leaving that aside, right, we could probably imagine a few examples where people who pursue a life of pleasure do not come to good ends. Where they... Uh, they ultimately suffer for that decision. Yeah, you might have some anecdotal cases, but that's not necessarily a, a good uh, conceptual argument. And, you know, it sure seems like there's some people out there who have a lot of fun uh, pursuing a pleasurable life. Well, you know, without really considering that, I think Aristotle at least is implicitly considering this possibility. Which is why he, you know, gives, he kind of slides this other argument in. It's like, look, if you're pursuing a life of pleasure, you're always going to need something else. You're always going to depend upon something else. If you're pursuing a life of culinary pleasure, you're always going to need the best chefs and the best food and the choices, you know, the choices options. If you're pursuing, uh, how shall we say, pharmaceutical alternatives, right? You're always going to need to rely on somebody else to provide those kinds of substances uh, to uh, you know, uh, indulge in in order to have that kind of life of pleasure. You know, if you are pursuing a life of wine, right, you're always gonna need somebody out there to make the wine and to be really good at making that wine. You know, if, if it's your variety of other sensualities, you're always gonna need other people, other things, other people's work in order to have that kind of life. That means, in effect, you're always gonna depend upon somebody else. You're always going to depend upon somebody else. And that's a little scary to Aristotle. It's like, how is it that my happiness, you know, an independent good, a good pursuit for its own sake, is always going to need something else for it. So it's going to need somebody else for that. Now he thinks that this happiness has got to be able to be, in a sense, self-contained. You've got to be able to do it. You've got to, you've got to be able to achieve this happiness without relying upon the work of somebody else. You know, an extreme version of this, of this always depending on somebody else, is something we're familiar with, is something that we already want to avoid. It's called addiction. So that's, that's the first thing that Aristotle considers, is uh, that you know, if you're pursuing this life of pleasure, you're always going to need to depend upon somebody else for that, and that's not going to be happiness. 
The second uh, option he considers is honor, what we might call public praise. Reputation is probably a good word here. Uh, how people think of you in the public sphere. And a lot of people pursue this. They do. So Aristotle asked the question, is this worth pursuing? Is this going to be the secret of happiness? Everybody thinking you're great and wonderful. Now, if you've never been the object of public praise, it's really pretty cool. You know? And I'm not saying I'm a, a rock star, but yeah, so more than a few times, a group of people have said, yeah, you, you've done a really great job. And it, and it feels great. It really does. Um, and if you never had that, you know, you, you probably can't relate exactly to what Aristotle is talking about there. But this, you have lots of people sing your praises to say you're wonderful and great. Yeah, that, that feels pretty good. But here's what Aristotle says. Like, look, what are the two possibilities with, with this kind of public praise? Either this public praise is coming from basically fools, right? idiots, morons, the unwise, or this praise is coming from the wise. Well, suppose the praise is coming from fools. It's not worthwhile, right? Why, why is that worthwhile, all right? Um, yeah, yeah, we know what it's, you know, we, <laughs> we've quite a few times looked at somebody who's praised by others that we deem less than honorable, right? And we deem them to be less of, than, of, of wonderful intelligence or character, right? And we think, oh gosh, yeah, sure he's being praised, but you're being praised by a moron. What, why is that a good thing? And this is Aristotle's point. Being praised by the foolish is not really praise worth having. It's not, it's not a big deal. Well, what's the other possibility? Uh, being praised by the wise. Well, if you're praised by the wise, you know, this is a big deal. It is, a, it is a good thing to be praised by the wise. But the reason why it's good to be praised by the wise is because it's wisdom that's you know, they're, they're praising you in virtue of wisdom. Wisdom is the thing that's worth having. Wisdom, this, uh, uh, this greatness, wh whatever it is, right? Uh, wisdom is the thing that's worth having, but not the praise itself. Right? The praise itself doesn't have any value. It's the wisdom behind it. It's the good, you know, it's the estimation of somebody who knows what they're doing that's worthwhile. So, somebody who's rather intelligent, somebody who's lived a great life, somebody who's, uh, you know, done good things in their life, they sit there and they praise and say, that was good. You did a good job there. Well, the reason why that praise is, wor is worthwhile is because of the good things behind the praise, not the praise itself. So, praise, you know, it's nice, sure, it's fun, right? it's not a bad thing, but it's not the secret of happiness. It's just wisdom whatever it is. So this leaves a third option. This leaves contemplation. Aristotle says, well, you know, it's not pleasure, it's not praise, it's not honor, uh, so it's got to be contemplation. That's what's left. Now, the question is, well, what is this contemplation? And even more importantly, how is it that contemplation gives one a life worth living? So Aristotle set aside sensuality and honor, left us with contemplation. Well, how, how did he get here in the first place? Well, well I think that contemplation is what's going to bring us happiness. Well, for Aristotle, um, the you know what's best for a thing, what makes a thing great, is going to depend upon what a thing is. What a thing is, and to understand what a thing is, you have to understand um, what it's like. And how it's different from what it's like. So that that's probably not clear all of a sudden. So yeah, suppose we're dealing with a couch. Right? Well, what is a couch? It would be a question. And to answer you know, what a couch is, you know, first we got to say, well, we got to identify things like a couch. And you know, besides other couches, right? uh, well, you know, for couches, what do we got? We got chairs. You know, things that are like couches. We got chairs. We got tables. Uh, we got, uh, what, um, bookshelves, things like this. These are all like couches. 
in the sense that they are furniture. They're, they're, they're furniture. Now, um, I mean, that's not the end of the story, right? Uh, to, uh, you know, you know, first step is to understand what it's, what it's like, what things are like it. And that's what, um, and it's not in this reading, but in, in, in other works of Aristotle, it's what's called the genus. Right? And the genus is the kind of thing. It's, it's what it's, the, things, the kind of thing that it's like. So the first thing that we know about a uh, couch is that it's furniture. The next thing we got to know is how it's different from what it's like. And this is uh, uh, called the species. So a couch is like a chair and it's like a table and it's like a bookshelf. But there are also some important differences. They're all furniture, but there's important differences. So let's start with the thing that's, you know, most, uh, you know, uh, very different from, right? That'd be a bookshelf. A bookshelf and a couch are both furniture, but a big difference between a bookshelf and a couch is that a bookshelf is just for books or, you know, for other things to be placed upon it, uh, but not people. Right? People do not occupy shelves of a bookshelf. Okay, so that's one thing. Uh, you know, but, you know, couches are like tables because tables are occupied by people. All right. Uh, well, what's going to make a couch different from a table? Well, um, you know, tables are occupied by people, sure, uh, but uh, people don't, or at least not supposed to, sit on tables. Uh, you're supposed to sit at a table, but not on a table. Hmm. So that's how couches are different from tables, you know, but couches are similar to chairs. Both chairs and couches are sat upon. Well, what's going to be the difference between a couch and a chair? Well, like a chair uh, has only one person, typically just one person, where a like couch has uh, two people or more. It's the idea. It could fit two people or more. So this is what makes a couch a couch. It's a piece of furniture that two or more people sit on. So furniture is the genus. Two or more people sit on it is the species. So if we're going to understand our happiness, if we're going to understand what's good for us, we have to understand what we are. So here's the question. What are you? Understanding what you are may not always be the easiest thing. So first we have to understand, understand uh, what we're like and then how we're different from what we're like. Well, probably the easiest way to start kind of divvying up this sort of thing is, you know, compare me to, I don't know, that wall. I am, of all the things that you can see right now on the camera, I am probably least like the wall. Um, the wall does not move. The wall is not alive. The wall uh, doesn't breathe, it doesn't grow. Uh, it has no will of its own. I'm even more like the water that's coming out of the wall than I am the wall. The water is at least moving. The water at least has living things in it. So there's, there's this first difference between me and, and, and you <laughs> and, and everything else. Right? And that is that I am alive. I have a soul. Now, Aristotle's not trying to get mystical here. Uh, a soul was just you know, that, you know, we think of a soul as this kind of, um, you know, ghost that inhabits our bodies that can leave and come back. And things like that. that wasn't what Aristotle had in mind. Not many ancients did have that idea. Um, you now the soul is just, uh, was this principle of movement. It was this principle of life. What animated you. Animated you. So, uh, I have a soul, the wall does not. And how do I know this? Because I can move, I have a will, and the wall doesn't. Now, so that's the first difference, right, between me and everything else. We have the difference between living things and things that are not alive. So let's look at the living things. Uh, there are more than a few living things out here, I can tell you that. Uh, it's one of the reasons why I come out here, is I like to be around life. So, uh, uh, amongst living things, we have what? Plants? We have animals and, uh, you know, us. Uh, now, I I'm pretty different from a plant. There's something, uh, you know, the, the plants have what's called a vegetative soul, what Aristotle calls a vegetative soul. And that just means that it has nutrition and growth, right? 
you know, plants, yeah, kind of, sort of, I mean, they grow, uh, but they don't really move, especially not like me. I can pick up and walk, the plant can't. <laughs> um, but there's something that the plant and I have in common, and animals, right? We all grow, we're all, we all take in food, we all need water. So all of us, the plants, the animals, and me, we have at least some kind of vegetative aspect of our souls. But there's a difference between me and the animals and, and plants, right? And that, that is, uh, you know, a will, right? We move, we make decisions, we move on our own accord. Yeah, so there's, there's this difference between me and plants, I'm sorry, animals and, and plants, and that, that's this, this movement. So uh, I'm going to share an excellence, at least some excellence with the plant. I'm going to share something that's good with the plant, namely nutrition and growth. But that's about it. Beyond that, the plant and I really can't relate to each other. Um, ne so next we have to consider the animals. Uh, there's a lot that I have in common and you have in common with animals, right? We have a will. We have desires. Since we have a will, we have desires. We try to fulfill the desires. That's what it means for Aristotle to have a will, is that, wi that which allows you to fulfill your desires. Now, uh, that, that's great and all. So, uh, we, uh, we share some goods with animals, namely fulfillment of desires. And things like, what, shelter, comfort, uh, joy, enjoyment of things, stuff like that. Uh, we have aversions too, fear, anger, that sort of thing. You know, basically, a lot of your emotional states. But there's something that we have, when we share this with animals, we share this... This, these desires, this, uh, this, this kind of part of the soul, but there's something that we have that animals don't, and that's a rational part of our soul. We can reason, we can think, believe, reach conclusions. We can understand the world. So, the, so we have, to so understand what we are, we are living things that have desires and reason. So there's, there's all living things, that's the genus, then to kind of separate animals from plants, right? Living things with desires, right? So plants are just things that grow. Animals are things that grow with desires. And then, uh, to, so that's an animal. Uh, and, and so on top of that, our genus is animal. And what separates us from the rest is that we have reason. And we can think. So for Ar according to Aristotle, we all have a rational part of our soul and the irrational. Might even better. Might even better to say non-rational. Right? Um, you know, this just doesn't have anything to do with reason. Right? So there's the vegetative part. There's that which uh, has nutrition and growth. That has the life, kind of the you know the starting point of it all. Then there's the desires, or the what's it called, appetition. Right? The desires, right? but these are still non-rational. And you know, Aristotle goes even so far as to say that desires can be irrational. They can be irrational. They can work against reason. And then finally, there's reason. Now, the happiness for Aristotle consists in this, this excellence of all the parts of the soul working together to being the best, to, you know, to function the best that it can. All right? So, this is kind of easy to understand where we start with the body. We start with the vegetative aspect. Good, you know, nutritious food. Even good tasting food, sure, to an extent. Right, bad tasting food isn't necessarily good for us, right? It's better to have better tasting food than, than terribly tasting food, but it does have to be nutritious. Water. Exercise. These are goods for the body. Then there's uh, the goods of, you know, desires. Sure. You know, our, we desire a lot, right? We desire sensuality. We desire honor. We do desire these things. We really do. Uh, and in that, in that sense, they're good, sort of. But we could be irrational in the pursuit of things like sensuality and, 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 and honor because they don't actually bring happiness. They actually knock us out of balance. So desires uh, can be good to the extent that they still maintain and they're, they're kept under control. They maintain that balance within the person, within the human being. And then there's finally contemplation, and the good you know, some of the examples of good uh, of these kinds of goods that Aristotle mentioned 
uh, it's, it's physical science, you know, knowledge of the physical sciences, knowing how the world works around you, contemplating, you know, we could think about contemplating great truths like mathematics and history, philosophy, wisdom, right? Um, to spend one's life in contemplation and, and understanding the world around us. Because that's something that we do that nobody else does, that nothing else does. We understand the world. We systematize it. We study it. We understand that um, there are differences in different places in the world. Right? We have the ability, though we don't always do this, we have the ability to understand that there's more than what we simply believe. And this is what's going to bring balance, excellence in a person. It's contemplation of the world around you and yourself.